Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a new webinar. First of all, I would like to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me yet. My name is Monica Soler and I'm the Healthcare Providers Director at Just One Global Office. I would like to thank you for your interest in this webinar and for giving us an hour of your precious time. We hope that you will find the content of this webinar interesting and that you will be able to take away some lessons and some learning from today's case study. Before we start, I would like to briefly remind you of the antitrust caution under which all GS1 meetings are conducted in compliance with uh, antitrust laws. Participation must be voluntary and non-participation will not be penalized. There will be no discussion of pricing, customer or product allocation, boycotts, refusals to deal or market shares. If a participant feels that the group is moving towards an inappropriate discussion, he or she may stop this discussion. And for more detail, you can read the full document by clicking on the link below. Well, for those of you joining, sorry. Here we are, sorry. For those of you joining for the first time, GS1 Healthcare Webinars offers you a unique space for sharing knowledge, best practices, learnings, and also for opinion exchange around three key objectives. To improve patient safety, to reduce operational costs and also to increase productivity. All this through the use of GS1 standards and the implementation of new processes and also innovative technologies as the ones we are going to listen to today. All this we offer on a bi-monthly basis and we encourage you to follow them in order to learn about those best practices in different hospitals all around the world. Some housekeeping for today's session, uh, just a few practical reminders. Please make sure that you identify yourself properly. You can use the rename function to do it. You are automatically on mute and your video is off. For any quick message or reaction, please use the raise hand function. For all questions, please use the Q&A function. Please do not use the chat for this and your questions will be addressed as much as we can. And at the end of the webinar, the recording will be available on GS1 website, uh, just for you to know that all webinars from the previous editions are also available in the same space. So please welcome our today guest, Graham Walsh, his clean Chief Clinical Information Officer at Calderley and Huddersfield NHS Foundation Trust. Sorry, Graham, for my terrible pronunciation. And John Walsh, Account Manager, Healthcare and Public Sector at Zebra. Today's presentation is part of the ambitious Scheme for Safety program that, as you know, has been launched in 2016 by the Department of Health and Social Care with implementation of GS1 standards for you, the unique identify of uh, persons, uh, even if it's patient or caregivers, uh, for products and equipments and for uh, every place with one objective to increase patient safety and improve also operational efficiency across the NHS. So we hope that the webinar will meet your expectations. I encourage you to participate actively at the end of the session by asking questions to both speakers. So over to you, Graham. Okay, thank you. So um, again, welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us for this uh, webinar. Um, so uh, as described, I am the, or I was the Chief Clinical Information Officer. I've recently left that role and I've taken up a role with the Allied Health Science Network as their clinical director. So my first task is to share my screen. Um, which if somebody could give me access to be able to share my screen, that would be great. Uh, <laughs> but basically what I'm gonna do today is essentially talk through um, 
what our experiences of the scan for safety project what is the scan for safety project and you know and the importance of the uh, gs1 and scanning so um i would love to share my screen but currently i'm blocked from doing that so at some point i should be able to do that um if somebody as i say is able to give me access to that just one minute graham trying yeah. to fix this sorry so as I say, while we wait, just for those that don't know where um, Calder and Huddersfield is, it's kind of somewhere between uh, Manchester and Leeds. Um, we're a large um, trust um, who are a fairly digitally advanced trust. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the solutions that we've we've brought to help us with the scan for safety. Um, but, you know, we are, as I say, moving towards kind of uh, improving our um, HIM score. We're currently... Uh, hymns five but certainly actively moving towards a hymn six and i think as anybody out there knows that um obviously scan for safety and, and gs1 compliance is an important factor in uh, digital maturity as well in the healthcare setting so with anything now we've got lots of people here um it's it's this time that things kind of go wrong and i think the inability to share my slides probably doesn't help um because what i want to do today really is go over what scan for safety is the reason why it's important um and go through the journey that we've gone through as a trust to implement our scan for safety journey so i think we're good to go now so here we go so this is the slides so as you see, this is, uh, I think we've already done the introduction. You know, it's an example actually in the picture in the background um, of using scanning uh, patient wristbands. So I think this kind of, when Scan for Safety started, it was Jeremy Hunt was a health secretary. And I think this kind of quote really does sum up what it was trying to achieve. It was, it was for healthcare. It was going to be vital to make the NHS the safest and most transparent healthcare system in the world. And I think we probably all agree um, it's probably doing. Um, it's not a finished journey, and I think we'll talk later where it's going, um, but I think it's certainly helped. You know, why do we need scan for safety? Why do we need these kind of things? Well, I think, you know, there'll be no secret that um, problems happen. You know, implants are one area where the wrong knee can be put in, the wrong hip can be put in, the wrong side. You know, we're in a position where, you know, as a knee surgeon is my other job, you know, we traditionally, we put an implant in, we don't know we've put the wrong one in, until later on when the um the the implants are scanned the implant labels you know so you scan for safety is something that can help with this you know we should be scanning prosthesis before they go in um whether that's in orthopedics or whether that's in you know in in other areas so you know this this is a major reason why scan for safety is important drug safety is also an issue you know when an, an implant goes wrong uh, a patient can be in discomfort when a drug goes wrong uh, a patient can lose their life and I think you know this if nothing else these headlines you know just demonstrate the importance of improving the safety um, using patients wristbands and making sure people get the right um, drug to prevent horrible um, errors like this never events happen and again you know this is the driver of why we need the, a safer uh, system you know where around the time of scan for safety never events were increasing and that led the nhs to to look for a solution and that's where um the scan for safety project came through so what is it well i think you know Professor uh, Stevenson kind of quotes it very nice. You know, we don't have fail safes in healthcare, and Scan for Safety with GS1 was was designed to give us that fail safe. So it started in 2016 uh, with the Department of Health and Social Care. Initially, six trusts were tasked uh, implementing GS1 standards. You know, that essentially gave a unique identification to the patient, to the product, and the place. Um, you know, we were not one of the original trusts, but we worked closely with leads who were. You know, the intention was to increase patient safety. To to improve efficiency um, across the NHS um, and using a GS1 barcode, it was unique to that patient. It could be used across vendors um, and it wasn't, wasn't tied to a certain computer system. It could be used for all devices, for all procedures and locations. And, you know, the scan for safety, as I say, uh, use the GS1 barcode. You know, what is the GS1 standard? I think, you know, it's important to know. Whenever I talk about scan for safety, the first thing people ask 
is what is scan for safety. So I think it's important to, to, to address that. You know, DS1 gives you a, a uniform data structure, which allows you to uniquely code, um, whether it's the patients, whether it's the, uh, the assets, um, or it's the places they're in. Um, these are device agnostic, so they should work across uh, platforms. Um, you, you know, GS1 has been around a long time. You know, you may remember the scandal of horse meat and beef burgers because supermarkets use GS1 standards that were very quickly able to recall um, the affected uh, meats. One of the problems in healthcare that we had prior to scan safety was, uh, you may remember the uh, PIP scandal, which is when um, prosthesis were put into women uh, that were withdrawn from the market because they were faulty. Because at the time we didn't have um, scan for safety and GS1 standards, it was really hard to identify those patients at risk. And it's still estimated that there's nearly 50,000 patients who still have a PIP implant within them who are living with um, the, the consequence of those. You know, and this would not have been such a big scandal had we had these safety procedures in place way back then. So what did the scan for safety project find? Well, this is the report that was produced. And it certainly kind of lived up to the expectations. Um, it found that from a patient safety perspective, drug errors were reduced, never events were, were reduced. It improved the way that we uh, did our observations on patients, ultimately improving their care. There was cost savings. You know, you it was more efficient. Um, there was less time wasted by staff. And we could be more accurate on, on costing things and knowing how we can manage our healthcare. So these are the kind of headline figures from the Scan for Safety project. A huge amount of time was quoted to, to have been saved, a huge amount of money. And bear in mind, this was only six trusts. Um, you know, and I think it's important to see how if you roll this across whole healthcare systems, the amount of time and money that would be saved. So this is kind of, if you like, the time frame of Scan for Safety from uh, where it started back in 2016. I think we joined probably... Um, uh, at, you know, at the end of that project into these sort of the, the 2020 when things were starting to roll out. And that's where I'm going to talk about our journey, because I think I've mentioned that we're from Colden and Huddersfield. So just for people that don't know, um, this is where we situated. This is uh, Colden and Royal. Um, this is one of the hospitals where we do most of our elective care. So what did we deploy? Well, we deployed as much scan products um, and safety products that we could. Uh, we use it for medication. We, we scan uh, the patient's wristband uh, and the medication uh, prior to giving them the drug. Um, again, hugely uh, reduces the time for the uh, nurse checks because you don't need two nurses checking, but it also reduces the risks of, of just some of the drug errors, which we talked about earlier. We have pathology and we use bedside scanning. We, make, we uh, use label printers to print the label at the bedside. And this just makes sure that again, the right uh, test goes to the right place for the right patient and again significantly improving patient safety. Inventory management we use this for uh, products ordering uh, you know it's interesting that you know I was involved in a project many years ago when we were bringing a theatre um, system in and it didn't use GS1 barcodes it used its own barcode and it created all kinds of nightmares because you'd have to print single labels for every device, whether it was a single screw that went into a patient's plate, um, you know, and it's a huge amount of cost and time that that took. So using um, an agnostic um, product such as GS1 uh, reduces some of those uh, time uh, and wasted money. We use blood, for blood transfusion in blood track, which we'll talk about. Um, we've got uh, GLNs um, around the ward uh, and the hospital, you know, and that reflects the, uh, the place. Uh, we use it for milk tracing. Um, we use it for acid tracking, even temperature monitoring, point of care testing. We have nerve center for observations, which um, uses um, scan for safety project. And we also have electronic medicine cabinet so we use it for a huge amount of areas and that's how important it is it goes across the whole span of healthcare and gives us benefits in 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 a huge amount of areas so i'm just going to focus on a few things you know this is the kit you know the scan for safety is not without um cost you know we 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 had to invest in a lot of kit that's um at the tags either digital or physical we need a lot of wristband printers we may discuss um why they're important um, with deployment as, as our uh, wireless scanners. We use a lot of Zebra devices, which I'll touch on a bit later. And we've got all these uh, GLNs uh, throughout the hospital. In fact, I found one on a toilet the other day. I'm not sure that uh, should have been there. So blood track. This device in the picture, actually, we've now superseded because we use the Zebra devices. 
it means by using scanning and using patient barcodes and barcodes on the uh, blood, it means that we're reducing never events. The risk of um, ABO incompatibility has dramatically reduced. And in fact, we don't see it anymore in our hospital. You know, the wrong blood in the wrong tube just doesn't happen. We make sure that the right patient gets the right product. product. Um, it also reduces the workload of the nurse because it just sings, it needs single nurse checking because we have the barcode and the scanning as the as a second checker. So that's also important. We use fridge temperatures. We've got 350 fridges across our estate. They're not monitored traditionally, and you know we don't know what temperature they were. So drugs or products could have, you know, been stored at the wrong temperature, and therefore we're giving or traditionally we may have given unsafe drugs to patients. What we found is that by uh, monitoring the temperature using um, these Stanley, uh, these Stanley um, monitors. It reduces the amount of risk of drugs being stored at the incorrect temperature and therefore improves safety. Um, nurses can be confident that the the, uh, the nurse, the drugs are stored at the right time and therefore they can give them uh, for immediate use to patients. Operationally, um, there is a reduction in manual monitoring where you used to have to go around with a bit of paper uh, and look at every fridge with a thermometer. Um, we lose less money because we're not wasting as many unsafe drugs. And we can identify fridges very quickly that, um, that need maintenance. And I think that's really important. We have asset tags. You know, before we had this project, we had lots of iPods. Um, and I don't know if in your hospitals you find that iPods, although they're they're not advertisers having legs. They appear to walk out of the hospital quite regularly. So we were losing a huge amount of um, uh, mobile devices. So using the asset tags, whether it's digital or physical, allowed us to track um, devices and know where they are. And this is many, many advantages. Uh, one, um, we didn't lose as many, and uh, therefore the, 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 there wasn't a financial burden. We knew where equipment was, and therefore we could easily cater and get it to the place where it is needed. Um, you know that in itself could produce a huge amount of time, both for operational teams and clinical teams. We knew where uh, lease equipment was, and we could get to it quickly and return it in a, in, in a timely fashion. You know, and you know, we knew, as I say, when things were needed for patient care that we didn't have a huge resource, we could get it. We use this for, you know, interesting use was during COVID when we required um, certain types of hoods and we only had a limited amount, uh, you know, and, and using these asset tags allowed us to identify and get those hoods to the right place quickly um, to, you know, so that the staff could deliver patient care. And these are the, the zebras. Um, you know, these are probably one of my favorite devices that we've we've had, the TC51 and, and subsequently now the TC52. <laughs> we've got about 800 of these devices. And the beauty about these are, you know, they're an Android device, they're multi-purpose, uh, they're incredibly robust. You can actually uh, well, I did think you could launch them across a the room, but I subsequently found you could only, you know, they they can be dropped from standing high and will, you know, um, you know, and, and maintain their integrity. They were really important to us during COVID. Um, they were infection control. They could be wiped down with Tristel. Um, and during COVID, when we were moving between patients and isolate, uh, isolated patients, it was really important. In fact, we even use these for some of our um, uh, visits, virtual visits, where um, patients could uh, meet a loved one um, virtually uh, using these devices. They've got a great optical scanner, which is, again, very useful for, uh, say, blood track. Um, we use it uh, even for things such as um, e-consent that we use. Um, a QR code is used on there, and these these can be used to help with that. Blood tracks on them, you can put in Parata so they can be a single sign-on. So multiple users can use this, the same device. Um, and therefore, if we have them in ED, for example, everyone doesn't need their own device. They could just tap and go and use that one. And we do use it for nerve center um, for our OBS that can feed into our EPR. We've got the GLNs now. They're all over the place. Um, you know, these are the uh, global location numbers that allows us to track uh, patients and inventory throughout the hospital. Improves uh, patient safety. It means we can get stock to the right place. We can get people to deliver stock to the right place. Um, and you know the, the it, you know it's a really an invaluable uh, thing for us, but I think more importantly, it's future proofing things. You know, you can use it for things such as you know patient wayfinder apps. Um, you know, so people can see where they are in the future. So these these are though we haven't got a hundred and one uses for them yet. I think it allows us to you know to move forward and, and think of good use scenarios. We have the Omnicell electronic medicine cabinets. You know these you know 
you know you scan to access the drugs it means that drugs can be safely uh, dispensed we know the stock level in real time um you know it reduces the amount of need for stock checks and it reduces drug errors and again it needs um, a single person to check because the scanner does the second check um, that would otherwise be done. And we have milk tracing. Milk tracing, again, um, we have uh, donor milk um, and also um, express milk in our neonatal unit. And using uh, milk tracing allows us to make sure that the right milk is given to the right baby and allows us to improve the safety and traceability within our uh, milk bank as well. And the other thing that we've we just uh, recently introduced is point of care testing. I think we're the first uh, in the UK um, to do this. We've connected all our point of care testing devices um, with our EPR and actually uh, scanning uh, the patient's um, wristband um, and scanning the sample um, means that we can get the right result into the right patient's record in, in real time. So, um, you know, whereas before it would be kind of typed in or printed, we now goes directly into EPR. And that's not just for the blood gas, that's for electrolytes, that's for the glucose meters, uh, the urinalysis, the COVID checks and, and the um, flu tests. So this, you know, this is a, a real benefit to, to staff. So we've got a full record of, of, of results. So what do we learn? A successful deployment. And, you know, I think we may touch on this in the question section, but you've got to set expectations. You know, you've got to make sure the staff know why they're scanning. You know, scanning patients can be a little bit cumbersome at times the device you've got to get the scanner you know we had wired scanners initially you'll see in the picture um these were tr troublesome to people to adopt <laughs> when we went to wireless scanners uh, people adopted them much better because they could take them around on the uh, laptop and wheels and take them to the patient the key for this as well it's an expensive project and you know safety needs to go above finance you know when you go into your finance managers you can't just say that you know you're going to save money because ultimately the, the reality is you're going to you know it's a safety issue scan for safety is not necessarily about finances it's about patient safety you've got to demonstrate this to staff to understand the importance of it and we use a bit of storytelling we show them the you know that what can happen when things go wrong and i think that resonates well with staff and it means that they kind of um, embrace embrace the change and work with us you've got to make sure you've got enough hardware there's no point having one scanner on a ward um you know when you've got lots of staff and lots of patients you've got to make sure that it's an easy ease to use now we talked about the zebras you know the wireless scanners you know devices are important because that really does help adoption and you've got to have support you know when you go live you've got to have people to encourage people you can bypass a lot of these uh scannings um within uh, EPRs and you've got to make sure people understand and people know and they have a presence with them and maintain that presence don't just walk away at the end of go live be there for the staff um, once once you know you've gone past that day and try and embed the, the importance of this safety um, to the staff. You know, so this is essentially just kind of sums up what we've got. It's, you know, it's about the product. It's about getting the right product. It's about getting the right patient. You know, it's about doing things in the right time um, and doing things in the right place, you know, in the right process. So, you know, there's a lot of things that Scan for Safety brings. And a lot of these are around safety. A lot of them are around time savings and a lot of them are around cost savings as well. So these are a few quotes. I think it's important, you know, I'm telling you how wonderful it is because you know, I sit as a CCIO, but I think it's also important to see what staff think. You know, the director of pharmacy, you know, real, real benefits to, to pharmacy. They've, they've loved this project. You know, asset tracking has been invaluable. We've, we, we've known where things are quickly. Really important, I think, as the quote says, uh, during COVID. Um, you know, reduced, you know, infection control, we've reduced the amount of people handling certain devices, you know, using some of the devices as well. Um, I, they can be cleaned in a safe way. Um, and I think, you know, having access to the um, mobile devices, the Zebras allows them to not only get on nerve center, but also things like Teams, um, you know, so, so I think, again, that has been really important. The wireless scanners, you know, they changed a lot for us. You know, um, I think Neil uh, standing for there, our associate director of digital health, you know, he was really um, spent a lot of time getting these in because um, it meant that people could scan at the bedside, which I think was really important. And again, everyone seemed to like the zebras uh, and those are the machines, not the not the animals. We don't have those walking around the corridor, um, you know, and having the, the ability to monitor you know, the fridges just gives us reassurance and, you know, that we, we're, we're giving patients safe, safe drugs um, and then we're not wasting medications.
so where's it gone? I think, you know, from the scan for safety projects and the work that, you know, a lot of trusts have now done, I think, you know, there is a much more widespread um, use of GS1 compliance. You know, it's there. We know it reduces safe um, never events. You know, we know it will reduce uh, drug errors. You know, traceability of implants. You know, we shouldn't be putting implants into patients without the ability to trace them. You know, um, orthopedics has been very at doing that, but other specialties haven't been as good. And I think the uh, Medicines and uh, Medical Device Act 2021 has kind of mandated that, you know, we really do need that traceability and GS1 is is, you know, is partnering on that. Um, you know, and the government's response has kind of, you know, pushes in the direction. Um, so where are we at with G, uh, GS1? Um, you know, this was the um, Medicines and Medical Device Safety Review. And I think, again, you know, they've stressed the importance of traceability. So it has now moved into the uh, NHS uh, Transformation Directorate. Um, again, they've put a, a lot of uh, importance on this and really pushing this out beyond kind of pilot sites, beyond kind of um, sites like ours who are, you know, good digital adopters. You know, it moves it out to the entire um, NHS uh, ecosystem. You know, it should allow us to, you know, be able to identify patients um, with, with problems um, with their devices expired devices, uh, reduce costs and allow us to monitor patients in the long term. And I think, you know, the, the partnering with the NHS form will allow that. You know, these again, you know, some of the benefits we've talked about, you know, uh, the patient safety, uh, fewer errors, much better recall. If there is, if there's ever anything like the PIP um, saga again, we will know quickly and we'll get those patients back to be seen because we are now scanning patients with um, and, uh, and devices. You know, we'll have better stock management, we'll reduce operational waste. You know, um, industry have done this, you know, aerospace, supermarkets, everyone's done it. You know, healthcare has lagged behind. And I think we need to get on board and make sure that, you know, university would do this. You know, and essentially for us, Better data collection, fewer errors. Data collection is so important on how we look at uh, the future of healthcare. Um, and I think this will, will certainly aid with that. You know, and it's not just the UK. You know, there's a, a four-nation approach to scan for safety. Um, although in England, it sits with the NHS Transform. The, the, it's also across Ireland, Wales and Scotland. So there is an importance to scan for safety. And I think, you know, we need to understand, you know, going back to the original slides, why we do this. We do this to save lives and we do this to prevent errors. And I think, therefore, you know, any organisation embarking on their scan for safety journey uh, needs to, you know, use that as the, the, the reason why. So I think that, from my point of view, I think concludes my slides. So I am going to stop sharing now, and um, we're going to go to questions, I believe. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Graham, for sharing, let me say so clearly and explicitly, the magnificent work that you and, and the whole team at the NHS, uh, you have done to improve patient safety at the end. Uh, a key part of the success of this project has been uh, obviously uh, try to impl implement, decide to implement or use global standards, but also um, the collaboration with your solution provider, with Zebra. So Zebra is also with us today to provide some clarity on the part of this, this solution. And now I, I will give the floor to my colleague, uh, Sophie Moll. She will introduce herself and also John. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Monica, and thank you very much, Graham, for this very insightful presentation. Um, I'm Sophie, and I'm working together with um, with Monica Giswan uh, Healthcare, and I'm leading the solution provider global uh, work effort. Uh, and in that context, I'm, I have the, the the pleasure to introduce you to John Walsh. So, John, if you would be so kind to turn on your video, he's an account manager uh, in healthcare and uh, the public sector at Zebra. Uh, is based in the UK. Thank you, super. And uh, Zebra is a long-term partner uh, of uh, GS1 Healthcare. We're very happy to have you um, with us. And we start a conversation maybe with um, with a couple of questions to both of you, uh, starting with Graham. Yes, uh, Graham, uh, let me break the ice 
maybe just asking you or sharing with you some thoughts. You have explained how uh, you uh, get clinicians to, to, to get engaged with this new uh, way of working, let me say this way, but how, how do patients have perceived it, this change? Yeah, and I think, you know, I think clinicians, you know, to clinicians sometimes, you know, and I think I mentioned in the talk that you have to set out the reasons why you're doing it, you know, those safety issues, you know, with anything in digital adoption can be tricky. Um, you know, a couple of extra clicks can sometimes be the hardest clicks, you know, to, to get people to do. But from a patient perspective, it's, I think patients have an expectation that we're kind of doing this already, you know. The whole process is safe. We see that, so we, we, you know, we have the patients there that you know uh, have the scanning, and then that you know see the the drugs given. That they've got that reassurance that it's it's the right you know it's the right drug to the right patient at the right time. So we do see patients kind of there's a, a degree of uh, you know of reassurance. You know, in, in my own field in orthopedics, when when I tell patients we've got the traceability of their implants you know, with, and we're able then to recall if there's a problem with the implant. Again, you see that level of reassurance for a patient because there are, there will always be, and there will be in the future episodes where, you know, a device has a problem, whether it's a, a knee implant or a, a breast implant or a, a cardiac stent, you know, and, and actually being able to tell the patient that if there is an issue, we'll be able to identify you as one of the people that have that and we can bring you back and make sure you're safe again i think these things are really reassuring for a patient yeah absolutely thank you graham and Sorry. in that context yes um in that context maybe to the question for you um john um graham in his presentation showcased a lot of uh, zebra devices and several yeah. tools um how, could you tell us a bit more about the, the importance of having um, the right partner all along the different phases of this implementation? Because we, we saw that it's a long journey. Um, and um, how did you develop the, the vision, this vision together with Zebra? Um, and and how, how it, was it important uh, in order to really get the, the, the patient at the center as well, keeping that in mind? Yeah. And the, the way we visualize things at Zebra are, um, it may sound a bit weird, but what we do is we make physical things digital. Um, and we do that through the use of, mainly through the use of barcode, but also RFID and other technologies. What we're there to do is, as Graham was saying, it's, it's being able to identify people, assets, pharmaceuticals quickly, accurately, and on time every time. Um, in our space, the critical element is the simple bit. It is the barcode on the wristband. If you're using, no matter how expensive your solution is, if the data you're pulling in and out of it is wrong, everything else goes wrong. So we are there to create a platform, to create a solution that allows those people in the hospital, be the clinicians, they could be porters, there are any number of other you know, uh, uh, supporting roles in that hospital on top of the clinicians who are all there putting the patient at the center. And we are there to provide that platform to make sure um, you don't have interruption of productivity. You don't have people going, right, I have to do this twice. I have to do that. I have to go and get something else to come back and complete my goal. Um, by being able to do it right once, you are able then to have that extra time to do something else. So you're identifying the patient quickly, therefore you're treating them quickly. You're identifying the pharmaceutical correctly, so you're providing it safely. And that's where we sit. So as well as the wristband, we have the label. We also have the TC51 that Graham mentioned earlier. And we have other products which will sit in that space. But that is the reality. We are there to provide that platform to make sure things work correctly. Um, one thing Graham mentioned earlier that you can drop this from use height. He also said, you can't throw it across a corridor. I take that as a challenge. So if you'll just give me a second. Let's turn this around. You can see the corridor. Um, <laughs> that's a clumsy example. But if you're walking through a busy environment, 
and you're working on a handheld device and you're tap, 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 and you're concentrating, it'll get knocked out of your hand and it'll bounce away. It's not that the device isn't broken. It's that there's no interruption of care. You can pick that device up, wipe it over and continue working. You don't have to go somewhere else. And as more and more we're seeing hospitals want to take that care to home to treat the patient where they live, because it saves money, it saves time, and you can be a lot more flexible. Having people out, having those clinicians out on the road, secure in the knowledge, confident in the knowledge that their device isn't going to fail, means that they can go out and give that care where the patient wants to have it. And when you're back in the hospital, it's the same, it's the same idea. It's don't miss that time. Don't lose your effectiveness. Using the right device in the right place makes you better, saves time, saves money, and helps reduce that risk. So hopefully that explains it a little. Yeah. And I think just just to add to what John said that, you know, we we've deployed a lot of these devices to our community teams as well. You know, so it gives that transition, you know, whether in the community or whether in the hospital, you know, having that one device that seamlessly can go across those both those healthcare uh, environments is really important. You know, simplicity, you know, you want some Something that you can trust you know i know john's just throwing it down the corridor he's probably looking scared now because he's probably going to pick pick the battery by something but they are fairly robust and that's what you need because in a hospital environment whether it's supporters using these the doctors or the nurses you know they're going to get dropped you know they're going to get left somewhere they're going to get a trolley rolling over them you know so actually robust is important because you don't want to go out you know we've all got ipods you wouldn't throw those across a room but actually you can with these yeah and and with that in mind, you're you know you if you're putting the patient at the center of everything, the last thing on your mind should be oh I better be delicate with this piece of technology I'm using. The in uh, for example, I'm not a clinician by any stretch, but I've seen in emergency departments when a patient's brought in and they are you know very badly injured, the thought isn't oh we better carefully move this out of the way. Everything's focused on the patient, so you're knocking things over, you're pushing things out of the way you're getting the job done. And it's only afterwards you'll go, oops. So by knowing that the device that you've dropped, the barcode scanners that Graham use as well, that you can clean them off and make sure they're fit for purpose to use again, it saves time, again, saves money. And hopefully that then feeds through to reducing patient risk. Thanks a lot. So going, going back to the objective, which is patient safety, uh, Graham, uh, I have a question. How you have engaged with your electronic patient record organization to adopt these standards? And is there more work to do? I think, yeah. I mean, we are a CERNA. So we have CERNA as our EPR, you know, and I think those on the call, you know, CERNA, massive global um, EPR, and it's great EPR. Um, and... I think there is a, this is, you know, essentially Scan for Safety is a UK initiative, um, you know, as we presented today, you know, and I think CERNA are, we're a little bit slow to adopt um, some of the uh, GS1 um, barcodes. We've done a lot of work with them as as other places have, and I think we're moving into that space. And I, I'm I'm sure you guys can probably update more than I am, but I think we're in a position where CERNA realise the importance, you know, and I think other EPR vendors do. You know, having your own kind of, you know, uh, barcodes isn't isn't good enough anymore because you know it it needs to be uh, ubiquitous across you know the health market. It needs to be as a, as I say, GS1 compliant, and I think CERNA are certainly doing that. Um, and I think they're they're kind of coming along on the journey now. But it, I wouldn't say it's been easy. And partly that is because you know they're obviously the major uh, platform is in the US. Um, but I think the UK market is getting stronger for them. And again, with with many things, it's probably you know it's 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 you know it's the market dynamic as well as patient safety that helps dictate some of these changes. Okay, thank you. And for you, John, I mean, following on the global standards. Um, and has a solution partner, would you like to explain us uh, why is it so important to develop solutions? Um, I think the, the, it's, about, it's about that very word. It's about the word standard. Um, if you are scanning the wristband I showed you earlier, if you're uh, uh, using a GLN code to identify an area, 
if you're buying a sandwich from a shop for lunch, it may not affect the person. It may not affect the patient, the customer, the service provider, but it does affect them because it wraps into the solution. And knowing you have that consistent standard across the board, it, it just means that those people can go to work being confident that they're going to be doing the right thing. What, what we're doing between us, how Graham's implemented this and how our devices work, is that we're um, using the automation of technology to remove the opportunity to make a mistake. And once people, it, it, like Graham mentioned earlier, there's this end user engagement where it is sometimes difficult to get people to work uh, who've been working in one process for a long time to pivot into another with technology. Um, once you get their buy-in, it really, it really makes a difference because those people are suddenly winning back time and the time they went back, they're spending that time doing the thing they're meant to be doing. They're not poking around inside printers. They're not looking for things. They're not trying to figure out if this device is right or this device is right. They're focusing all their time on their patients. They're spending their time on clinical, critical care because that's what they're paid to do. And all the people who surround them and support them with the, you know, the people who work in inventory control, people who are ordering in um, consumables, people who are doing all those other essential roles are all equally confident in getting their job done because they know when they scan the barcode in the inventory control area and that comes to the ward, they scan the same barcode with the same type of device and they get a standard across the board. Um, we've recently, uh, one of your colleagues, Natalie, came in recently and we've recertified all our healthcare devices to GS1. So all our barcode scanners, all our mobile computers, all our printers are ready at that level to be used. Um, I, I just think, you know, it's, there's no easier way to say it. It's a no brainer. Why would you not use GS1 as a standard across, across your environment? It just makes sense. Thank you, John. Monica, would you like to address the question of the audience maybe? Yes, please. We are going to move to the Q&A uh, session for the audience, as we have on the on the uh, functionality some questions. And uh, uh, there is one which would you be able to share how you're working with manufacturers to enable a GS1 compliant barcode on medicines? And what do you need? I guess this is for Graham. Um, so uh, I think the 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 only kind of I suppose manufacturer we've had to engage with about GS1 really was Cerner, and again that was just it's an education piece it's for them to understand the importance of of the compliance, you know why we need the compliance, um, you know it's on the medications again, you know the medications, you know that is a a another kind of bit with Cerner so. Um, it's it's really it's just engaging with them and, and explaining the importance. Um, but you know anybody that isn't compliant, you know, as I think as John has just said, you know, it is a no brainer. It really is because you know any future kind of development, you know, the way the NHS is moving, NHS transforms, involved now, you know, I imagine it'll get to a stage if you're not compliant, you're kind of not coming in. You know, that might well be in in the direction of travel. Thank you, Raham. There is another question from, I guess this is a colleague from the NHS. He says, this looks fabulous. I am on the beginning of the scheme for safety path at my trust. Where would you recommend to start to get the most benefit? Yeah, so again, I suppose it's where you are digitally, how, you know, where you are on your digital journey. You know, if you or, you know, if you've got an EPR and you're all singing or dancing, you know, um, you know, it, I suppose where you start is where your where your hospital wants you know there's no point going in with something you know just picking a an area that you're going to focus on actually go out to the teams and see where they see the value involve the clinical team so actually you know they identify where they feel that you know present to them what scan for safety is present to them what it can offer you know do a workshop you know whether it's with gs1 or, or some you know um and then you know explain the benefits of uh, with with some of the if you like the key players within the organization and get them to feedback where they see the initial value because if you go in start the project with really enthusiastic people that are on board that's going to resonate across you know the whole platform as you start to bring it into other areas so go out to your teams and, and see where they see the value 
because actually it doesn't matter where you start it's, it's more important that you do start um, and actually don't pick difficult wins you know there'll be areas that you can instill very quickly you know and, and work on those because once you get the foot in the door in a way then people start to see the value and start to see the benefit and adoption then becomes kind of ubiquitous across across an organization but involve the teams don't just tell them this is what we're going to do this week you know do a you know do a workshop i think workshops are great for getting those ideas out and people are you know people exploring the potential because from those workshops people will then say actually here's a great area where I think, you know, we've got an issue with, let's, let's focus on that initially. Um, Graham, can I just add to that? Um, I'm an outsider looking in at healthcare. So I work with hospitals, but I don't, I, I wouldn't ever claim to have any real true knowledge. But what I would say is, um, don't try to reinvent the wheel. You have colleagues throughout the NHS who've done this already. So it may not fit exactly with what you want, but go and talk to those people, go and talk to other hospitals. If you go on LinkedIn, and I'm sure there's internal networks in the hospital, you can reach out to Scan for Safety colleagues who will tell you what they've done. Don't, don't send yourself crazy trying to build something from scratch. The other thing I'd suggest is GS1 themselves. Uh, yes, there's a host of healthcare partners who are listed, but I would also think it, it might be useful to go to other elements of GS1. So you've got the healthcare part of the, of the organization, which is great, there is retail parts and they use GS1 in potentially different ways, but different ways which may actually be useful and resonate up, across different verticals. Um, I have a colleague who was in the healthcare team for a long time. She's moved to our retail team and we found a GS1 case study for one of her customers. And because her background in healthcare and her knowledge of GS1, she could leap straight into that. So there's what I'm saying is that there's more data out there than you actually realize. And, you know, don't suffer in silence. Go and meet, go and reach out to those people and ask them the questions because uh, the people I've spoken to in healthcare, they're busy, but when they have the time, they'll always help. And I think, you know, going back to that, I think you're going and see, and that's the most important thing about transformation, isn't it? You've got to, you know, the teams have to see it works. You know, actually going to see an organization that's doing it well is really important. We're moving to the next question on the chat. There is one regarding uh, what are you doing in the operation rooms or intensive care units to ensure injectables are prepared without errors and administered correctly? Mary has published 1133 cases has a preventable preparation error. Not this is the only spot in the hospital where one person is prescribing, preparing and administering. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose on that, you know, are we scanning for safety in those areas? Um, probably not. I think, you know, that, that you know, that that's kind of probably sits slightly out of this area, you know, um, whether it's, you know, it's about pre-preparing some of those injectables, you know, whether you use the pharmacy systems, you know, whether they're, you know, um, so I think I'm probably going to, um, I'm probably not going to be able to answer that very well. Um on a basis that you know it's you know there are things in place you know we give infiltration for example around our joint replacements that does involve mixing uh local anesthetics with um with adrenaline you know these can be pre-made by certain manufacturers um but at the moment as i say we don't have a really good safe way of doing that and errors do happen you know um it's got to be done safe it's got to be done with the right checks but currently we're not necessarily scanning those in the operation room and ICU that is somewhere where we probably need to get to and I think your point is really valid because you know those never events and those episodes would certainly go down if we were scanning those in the theatre and the ICU setting um, so I think it's probably you know it's a, it's a good it's a good point and I think it's something I'm going to take back and I'm going to actually have that question and we maybe look uh, at maybe doing that because you know there uh, you know every month whether it's in the independent sector or the nhs injection 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 errors happen you know whether it's the wrong place um the wrong um the wrong drug um and i think it's important actually so to your point i'm going to go away and look at that actually thank you um graham if you need any help and we can help with that let us know because yeah we're happy to the the other thing i would think is just from across vertical 
perspective is if you find a process that is difficult to improve because the technology is not quite there yet, don't drive yourself crazy. Go and fix the things you can fix. Because if you can improve a process somewhere else, which is saving time, that's extra time to allow you to analyze these injectables to make sure that they're safer. So you, you might not win in that very specific position, but by winning across other positions, you are freeing up that time and that bandwidth to allow you the time and bandwidth to make sure that those, those processes are done correctly. So those, even if you're not fixing the exact thing by fixing other things, you may be by uh, default helping yourself fix those. Okay, thank you. There is maybe one of the last questions uh, and it's for you both. Have you seen during the presentation 1D barcode used for GLNs? Why not use 2D barcodes like GS1 data matrix? <clears throat> um, so my, my response to that, you know, there's some of the pictures I've used, um, you know, may have been pulled off Google um, or may have been early iterations of some of the codes. So I'm not gonna get technical on the 1D, 2D, However, I'm going to pass that question off to John because I think he's probably hopefully got more of a technical background into that. Um, I am, friend, but not sure if it's technical. Um, my my suggestion to anyone is do what works. Um, always try to improve things, but do what works. So, for example, we have a dual a label here. It's got a 2D, which is a GS1 data matrix, and a standard 1D. It's got the same data, in it. so it's what works for you. Um, uh, the advantage of the 2D is that you can hold more data in it. So you could have full lines of text and more information. So if you were using a GLN and you scanned the code, you could see on the screen of your device where this location is, what the location should be for, what state it should be in. Um, but yeah, I, I think the most important bit is that that barcode is a, G, is a GS1 barcode. Um, as long as you're following the standards, um, whether it's a 1D, 2D barcode, if it's an RFID tag, it, whatever it is, as long as it's within the standard, that's the core driver. Um, the other thing you can do with this is, although Zebra is an organization, we know about this, we also have a channel of... Uh, resellers, software vendors, solution providers. So we work with Cerner, we work with Epic, but we work with lots of other people. And there are specialists who you can reach out to and contact who can give you all the information you need. So if it is an advantage to move to 2D, you can do that. Um, the key advantage isn't the actual barcode, it's the technology. There are very, very few 1D scanners now. They're more fragile. They're, they use lasers, so there's more health and safety if you were foolish with them. The 2D uses an imager with digital camera. So it's safer to use. It's more robust. It's less likely to break. So <clears throat> that would be the advantage of using 2D, really, from my perspective. Thank you, John. And thank you, Graham. So we are just uh, arriving to the, the final of this, uh, of this webinar. So let, let me ask you a final question. Uh, look into the future. Look into the next steps, maybe. Um, what other use cases do you have planned now that you have the, the, the foundational element implemented? Um, well, we're going to start scanning the drugs in theatre now. Um, <laughs> so, but I think for us, it's kind of the, you know, I think the GLNs are really important to us. You know, it's we, we're going through re reconfiguration at our hospital at the moment. You know, we've got, you know, GLNs everywhere. You know, we've got patients coming in. Can we use that actually not just patient safety, but kind of patient friendly, you know, helping people get to the location they want to, you know, through scanning on, the, on a mobile app, um, it'll get them to the right place. So I think for us, it's about, you know, it's not, you know, the patient safety thing. I think we, we covered most bases. I think we're in a good place. I think now we've now got to think beyond the box and actually can we improve the patient patient experience, you know, get them to where they need to get to, you know, whether it's a clinic room, whether it's the coffee room, whether it's the, you know, uh, the theatre block. So I think that that's that's where I probably where we're looking to next. And that just fits in with our reconfiguration project. OK, thank you, Graham. Unfortunately, we do not have time for more questions today. Uh, I would like to congratulate both of you, John and, and Graham, for your uh, and you, all your teams, obviously, for the extraordinary work that you have done. Uh, just 
a few weeks ago, uh, the World Patient Safety Day was held, as you know, in which important organizations in the sector have joined GS1 uh, campaign in order to raise awareness of the need to ensure these five fundamental rights of the patient that you have mentioned, Graham, on your presentation today, which is an objective uh, that you have worked uh, towards in this project. So I believe that this project or the project like those ones we have seen today, a clear example to follow. And I hope that they will serve as an inspiration for all of you. Thanks once again to Graham and John for sharing all your experience and knowledge today with us. Uh, also to George from Just One UK for your support in making this webinar happen. And of course, to all of you for attending. Finally, I would also like to kindly ask you to fill in the evaluation uh, questionnaire that we will send you after the, the webinar as your feedback help us a lot to improve. So hope to see you at the next one. Thank you and good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.